if I want to get an MRI and, I, and someone says I can get one, yeah. just try to walk me through the process. How, you know, how long does it take? Mm-hmm. I, I got to get a contrast. Is this something that is going to be claustrophobic? I mean, if yeah. you were to walk someone through an MRI in terms mm-hmm. of time, contrast, um, any of these basics that I want to know so I'm not scared going into right. it. Can you walk us through that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, although the amount of time that you're at the imaging center will be about an hour and a half, okay. the amount of time you're in the scanner is about half an hour. Um, and about 25 minutes of that is scanning and five minutes is getting in and out of the scanner. Okay. Um, currently, we do use contrast because it helps us detect cancers and it helps us to a very small degree classify them in terms of their overall risk. Um, And so one reason why there's a lot of interest in getting away from the use of contrast, um, especially in resource limited situations like, uh, you know, countries that are developing or you know, Kaiser or, you know, Canada, where they really want to tamp down on the amount of resources they have as much as possible, um, is it doesn't affect the suspicion that much. But I have seen that it does help with detection. So you see things much more distinctly on the, the dynamic contrast images. And there are rare but common enough cases where uh, the diffusion component fails. And then we need dynamic contrast in order to make up for that. Um, So one thing that I suggest to my colleagues where they want to come up with a uh, non-contrast, accelerated, very abbreviated protocol, do the T2 and the diffusion weighted imaging, which are the other two components. Um, You can get that all done within 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then look at the images, and if you really need contrast, bring the patient back. And you might think, well, can't you just do it while I'm on the scanner? You'd be on the scanner for another half an hour while we're trying to process all the data, transmit that to our workstation, read the data, make that decision. So it's not efficient to do that while the patient is on the scanner. But what you're saying is you don't always have to use contrast. Right. So And so I'm a patient walking in. At least yeah. now I know I'm 30 minutes in the scan. That's not too long. Right. Easier said than yeah. done. Yeah. And... Do I bring that conversation up when I'm there? Do I really need contrast? I mean, how does that work for the patient? Right. Because I would assume they're gonna, they're just gonna give contrast they in will. many cases without the if the patient doesn't bring it up. And they should. And they should. Okay. Because ultimately, you want the best test. You don't want a test that maybe it's good enough, maybe it's not, and. You don't want a test done by a radiologist who's used to the best test, where you're getting some unusual version of it. So if you're in an environment where they do a lot of non-contrast examination, so my neighbors across the street at Sloan Kettering, for follow-up, they do non-contrast. And you know, far be it for me to criticize potentially the best cancer hospital in the world. If you want to, you should. But um, I think if you have the degree of expertise that my esteemed colleagues across the street have, that makes it a little easier. Um, For most of us, and myself included, um, it's often enough, maybe even half the time, where having that contrast helps a little bit. Would I make a different uh, assessment without it? Probably not, but it does help. And the risk to the contrast, as far as we can tell, is almost negligible. The main risk is allergy, because some people will be allergic. And that, the severe allergies occur in about one in 100,000 patients. So there's another concern that we now know that the gadolinium ion deposits in a portion of the brain called the basal ganglia. Yeah. And you know, that's not normal, and we can see it, and maybe that's not good. But as far as we can tell, in tens of millions of scans, where we look at patients that have the exact same medical history, and some got an MRI with contrast and some did not, 
there was absolutely no detectable difference in their neurological mm. uh, assessments. And so, although it does deposit, it's maybe not a bad thing. As far as we can tell, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. So, I, I think, though, what changed the game a little bit, and this is probably for another time, yeah. is that in December of 2017, I want to say December 19th, but I'll Google that, see if I'm right or wrong, the FDA came out and said, contrast, uh, heads up, we're not sure about it. Right. And then they produced a table of safer contrasts. Yes. And gadolinium came up there as a safer contrast, yeah. which is good. Yeah. But, um, so I don't know if you've had fallback from that 27 report, 2017 report, yeah. where they said, look out, we're not sure what to say, but there might be a concern. There are two main classes of gadolinium-based contrast agents, the cyclic and the linear. Mm. And the cyclic is what we call a chelate, or a molecule that binds the ion of gadolinium centrally. And it, so because it's in the middle, it has a much stronger binding affinity, meaning that the likelihood that this little ion can escape and get into the basal ganglia is much smaller, uh, orders of magnitude, so like hundreds of thousands of times smaller. The linear compounds still bind it very tightly. It's not just floating all around in your bloodstream, but we can measure the difference. And we've basically gotten away from all of the linear compounds, except mm. for two of them, um, because they have a very specific different activity in the liver. So um, they're known as gadobinate and gadoxetate. Um, God bless you. Thank Sorry, you. that was an easy joke. I had to throw that in. Fair enough. No, <laughs> but so we use uh, one called gadobutrol, which okay. is a trade name Gadavist. Yes. Clever, right. Which, but that and that came up as 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 a healthier one to use, right? right? So, so we know that it's safer in terms of it's less likely to dissociate from the chelate, meaning leak into the brain. Um, but again, even with the cases where we do see it in the brain, we. Th think that it's probably completely safe, but we don't know. And that's the main concern that we have right now. Um, so is it worth the risk of getting contrast? Yes, because the risk of something bad happening from prostate cancer is something we can quantify. We can tell based on your PSA and your medical history, what's the likelihood that you will have a bad event from prostate cancer. The likelihood that that will occur from the gadolinium ion is so small that we can't measure it. So, so it's safe to say that you generally need the contrast and it would be smart to make sure that the contrast that your person is using is on the list of the better, safer yes. contrast. Yeah, so right? it's a, a cyclic contrast agent. Cyclic contrast agent. Yeah. 